Welcome to Faith at Work, the preaching and teaching ministry of W. Carey Hedgepath. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And now, Faith at Work. Well, good morning, or, or good evening, depending on what time you happen to be watching our broadcast today. And welcome to Faith at Work. Uh, as you, if you're a, a regular viewer of our television program, you will recognize right away that I am not Dr. Carey. Uh, Dr. Carey, my father, is away for a few weeks, uh, and he has graciously uh, uh, asked me uh, and given me the opportunity to be with you. And so I'm looking forward to our time together as we study God's Word and consider uh, so many wonderful things that the Lord has for us in His Word. I'm going to be uh, teaching today from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, which deals with the call of, uh, of Matthew, also named Levi. I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version today. And so if you have a Bible there in front of you, follow along with me in whatever translation that you have. Uh, if by chance, if you don't have a Bible, just listen clearly and carefully to the Word of God uh, as we read it. Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. The Word of God says this, After this, he, that is Jesus, after this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, also Matthew, sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he, that is Matthew or Levi, rose and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, those who are sick, they're the ones who have need of a physician. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, if you've watched our program before, or if you're a regular viewer, uh, you know that here at Faith at Work, we make it our aim every single time that we're with you to preach and teach and proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified and also Him risen from the dead. And not only do we proclaim and preach the salvation that is in and through Jesus Christ alone, by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, but we also make it our aim to proclaim to you and to anyone who will hear the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And by that, what we mean is this, is that not only is Jesus Lord over all, but He is certainly the Lord of those for whom He died. In other words, those who know Him, those who have truly trusted in Him, we proclaim in accordance with God's Word, with God's Word, that they follow Him. Now, they may not do it perfectly. We don't, we as believers, we don't, uh, we, we, we don't always uh, live the way God would have us to live in perfection this side of heaven, but we will seek to follow Jesus. And that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to speak with you about the call to follow Jesus. The call to the Christian faith, friend, is nothing less than the call to become a disciple, that is, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as we consider these things today, out of this passage, out of our text, I want to speak to you about three particular matters pertaining to the call to follow Jesus. And as we consider these things, I'd even ask this question right up front. Are you following Jesus? Have you received the call to follow Jesus? And if so, how's how's that following going? Are you following Jesus? Are you a truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope you are. Follow along with me as we, as we look at this passage. And we're going to look at three different things. First of all, we're going to consider the simplicity of the call to follow Jesus. And then we're going to look at the substance of the call to follow Jesus. Now, both of those have to do with the what? With the simplicity, we're going to talk about well, what do we mean when we say 
Uh, what do we mean by following Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And by the substance, we're going to basically hopefully answer the question from the Word of God as to well, what does it look like in practical terms. And then the last thing, if we have time, that we'll look at today is the subjects of the call to follow Jesus. The first two deal with the what. The last one deals with the who. And hopefully, uh, with the help of the Lord, we'll get to that matter. But let's consider, first of all, the, the simplicity of the call to follow Jesus. The simplicity of the call. Listen again to verse 27 out of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 5. Here's what it says. It says, after this... That is, after the things that have been taking place before, Jesus had been healing. He had been ministering. If we go back uh, to chapter 4 of Luke and chapter 5 of Luke, we see that Jesus uh, had healed a, a, a man uh, with an unclean demon in him. He had, he had uh, uh, healed others. He cleansed a leopard. He healed a man who couldn't walk. He'd done all these things. And now he was getting ready to, to heal and to cleanse a man of, of his sin. And it says here, after this, he that is Jesus, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. We also know that that same Levi is, was also a, is, is, had another name, that is Matthew. He, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi or Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And Jesus said to him two very simple words, follow me, follow me, two very simple words. Certainly, when Jesus told Matthew to follow me, to follow him, it was an imperative. That, it, that is, it was a command. Jesus didn't ask him to follow him. He looked at him, stopped dead in his tracks, looked right at him, eyeball to eyeball, and said, You, you come and follow me. And so, yes, it was a command, but it was much, much more than a command. In fact, it was an invitation it was an opportunity of a lifetime, especially for a man like Matthew. Now we know from the Word of God two particular things about Matthew. One thing we know about Matthew is that he, he, was, he wrote the first gospel that we have. The gospel according to Matthew. He wrote that actually to his own people, to the Jewish people, to prove that Jesus was the Christ. And so we know that about Matthew, that he was the author of the first gospel. But there's a second thing that the Bible tells us about Matthew, and that's this, and it's right here in this passage, that Matthew, by his own choice, was a tax collector. Now, to be a tax collector in that day was a little bit different than it is today. Tax collectors today are employees of our own government, of our own federal government, and they take up, as you know, and you may or may not like it, they take up money, they collect money in accordance with the law to, to, to pay for certain things to keep our country moving forward. Infrastructure, uh, uh, health and education, all kinds of things. And we're not going to get into politics today. But that's what a tax collector does. We may not like tax collectors. We may feel that they tax us too much and all those kind of things. But they are necessary in a civilized uh, society like ours that we might uh, have a country that has all the good things that uh, we've been blessed with uh, by the Lord Jesus here in the United States of America. That is not quite the same type of tax collection that was going on in New Testament times. Tax collectors, much like Matthew, were men of Jewish descent, at least within Palestine, men of Jewish descent, who collected money by force, carrying with them the penalty of law, and they ta collected those taxes from their own people on behalf of the Roman government. And they had the right to do so. And there was nothing that anybody who was a Jew could do anything about it. It would be more synonymous today if somebody, an American, came to your door representing a government of another country and forcibly, under penalty of law, demanded from you money to pay for that government, which was a foreign government. That's more closely related to what Matthew was doing. Why Matthew became a tax collector, we have no idea. 
We don't know if he just didn't, couldn't get a job doing something else and he made a decision that he would become a tax collector or if maybe he just needed some extra money or maybe he was just uh, had, had a, a beef against his own people. We don't know why. But he, by cho- his own choice, became a tax collector. And in doing so, his people saw him as a traitor. And by virtue of that, he became a social outcast. He was an outcast of society. society. He was an outcast uh, from, uh, from his own religion. He was an outcast in his family. He lost it all to go and to do this particular job. As far as his own people were concerned, he was a man who was without hope, absolutely no hope. And Jesus looked at this man and he said to him these two simple words, you're the one, you follow me. The simplicity of the call. Well, by simplicity, what do we mean by that? Well, very quickly, here's what we don't mean. We, we don't mean by the simplicity of the call to follow Jesus that, that, that the call to follow Jesus is, is something that one can naturally do. It's just so simple that anybody can decide at any time they want to do it. On the contrary, the Word of God tells us that we're not even naturally inclined to do to follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 44, He said, no one can come to me. That is, no one can follow me or follow after me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And He explained a little bit better uh, a few verses later in verse 65 of John 6 when He said, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. So it's not something that we naturally do. So by simplicity, we don't mean that. We also, by simplicity, we don't mean that it's something that's easy to do. It's not easy to follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said over in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14, he said that wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there's a lot of people on it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And few find it. He was talking about following Him. It's not easy to follow Jesus. And many of you know that. But by simplicity, we also don't mean that it is not without joy or that it's not without significance. In fact, the call to follow Jesus is the most significant thing that one could ever do. Paul said this to the church at, at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and around verse 18. He said that the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. It's, it's, it's the most insignificant thing that could be. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. And Paul went on to say to the church at Ephesus, he said that for those who are saved, that they're saved by grace through faith. And that of themselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that those who are saved are are, are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should do and that we should walk in. And those good works don't save us, but those good works, that is the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of following Jesus... Or the, is the will of God and the things that He would have us to do. It is a significant life. Well, then what do we mean by the simplicity of the call to follow Jesus? Well, two, two things very quickly before we move on. By simplicity, we simply mean this. That the call to follow Jesus, first of all, is not complicated. It is just not complicated. It is very straightforward and exact. When Jesus looked at Matthew, at Levi, and he said, you, follow me, Matthew understood exactly in a very straightforward way what Jesus was saying to him. The word that's used here for in, in the Greek uh, for follow is actually used over 70 times uh, in the Gospels uh, pertaining to following Christ. And every time that it's used when it pertains to following Christ in the Gospels, it it either has a literal meaning or a metaphorical meaning. And by literal, I mean this. It means, if, if it has a literal meaning, it means to go literally where Jesus goes. Or it has the metaphorical meaning, which means to go as Jesus goes. And sometimes it, it carries both those connotations. So anytime you see in the Gospels where, where the word follow is being used, 
in reference to following Christ, it means to either go where He is going or to go as He is going or both. It's straightforward. It's not complicated. And that is exactly what Matthew, sitting at that tax booth, that's what Levi heard. When Jesus looked at him and said, follow me, Matthew heard this. He heard Jesus give him an invitation like this. You come and go with me or you come and be with me, be where I am. And at the same time, you come and be like me. That was the call to follow Jesus. It's a very simple call. And it's not complicated. And the call to follow Jesus is the same today. But also by simplicity, we mean this. Not only is it not complicated, but in accordance with God's Word, it is not optional. It's not complicated, but it's not optional. And here's what we mean by that. A true Christian, a true believer is nothing less than a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. Because if you don't hear anything else we say today, this, this this may be the most important thing. And that is this. A true believer is nothing less than a follower, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. To follow Christ is not merely to believe certain doctrines about Jesus or to adhere both mentally and or emotionally to those doctrines about Jesus, but it is to walk as He walked. That's what it means to follow Christ. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus made this statement about His people, about those whom He came to save, about those who follow Him, about those who believe upon Him. He said this. First of all, He called them sheep. And He said this about them. He said, I know my sheep, and they hear my voice. In other words, they know me. I know my sheep, they know me, and they hear my voice. In other words, I, as the shepherd, can be understood by my sheep. They know my voice. They hear me in their hearts when I speak to them. They recognize my voice. And then Jesus said this, and they follow me. The simplicity of the call to follow Jesus. Friend, it's not complicated. And it's not optional for those who would be with Him. And that brings us to a second matter, and that is the substance of the call to follow Jesus. And by the substance of the call to follow Jesus, we simply mean this. What does it look like to follow Jesus? If I know it's not complicated, if I know it's not optional, in accordance with the Word of God, then then what exactly does it look like to follow Jesus in accordance with what the Word of God says about these things. Well, listen to verse 28 uh, of Luke 20, uh, of, of Luke chapter 5. Now again, Ma- Jesus has just stopped and looked at Matthew. He's looked at Levi and he said, you. No, he, he didn't say it to anyone else. He stopped and looked at him. The last person you thought he would have looked at and said, you come follow me. You'd think Jesus might have gone to somebody that, that, that at least uh, hadn't turned his back on his people. You, look, you think that Jesus would have looked at somebody who, who at least uh, hadn't committed these type of heinous sins against God's covenant people and against God Himself, like Matthew. He'd have gone somewhere else. But Jesus said, no, you're the one. You follow me. And listen to how Matthew responds to this, how Levi responds in verse 28. It says this, And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. In other words, Matthew didn't sit there and say to himself, well, you know, let, let, let me think about that. He didn't do that. He didn't say, let me, let me check with my friends and see what they think about it. He didn't say, let me finish counting the money. Let me go make up a deposit down there at the local bank. No, it says 
that he left everything. The, 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 what's being uh, shown here is the immediacy of it. He left everything and he rose and followed him. A little over 10 years ago when uh, I, uh, I met my wife and fell in love and she with me, uh, I had to make a decision. Now, since I was in love with her, it really wasn't that hard a decision to make. It may, she probably had the harder decision to make as to whether and how she was going to answer the question that I was going to ask her. But I made a decision. I made a decision that I wanted to marry her. And I made a decision to ask her to marry me and to be with me and me with her for the rest of our lives. And when I made that decision, it was a decision I would gladly made because I loved her and I wanted to be with her. But in order for me to be married to my wife, it meant that there were certain things I was going to have to leave behind. I could not go forward in life with her and her with me unless I was willing to leave certain things behind. There's just no way about it. So when I asked my wife to marry me, I did so with the understanding of many things, but one of the things was this, was that I was, I was leaving single life behind forever. And by single life, I, I, I simply mean this, that I was leaving behind my right to basically live my life the way I wanted to live it, even as a Christian, uh, as a single man. That I could get up whenever I want to and go to bed whenever I want to. That I could eat whatever I want to. That if I wanted to get in my car and drive to another city and see a friend, I could do it. I didn't need anybody's permission. All those kind of things. No, if I was going to be with my wife, I had to die to myself, leave myself behind, and put her first. If I was going to be with her. A few years ago, my doctor told me, he said, Bill you got to lose a little bit of weight. you got to get your cholesterol down. You've got to do some of these things. And in order to do that, I had to leave behind Whoppers and French fries. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I could not go forward. I could not go towards health and hang on to those things. I had to leave those things behind. Folks, if you and I, in a much more significant way, are going to follow Jesus, we are going to have to leave certain things behind. It says of Matthew that he rose up and he left everything behind. What did he leave behind? He left his career behind. He left all that money on the table behind. He basically began the process of leaving relationships behind. He was going to have to leave those relationships. That meant he couldn't love his friends, but he was going to have to leave all that behind if he was going to follow Jesus. And he knew that if he left his career behind and left the money, it was not something he could go back to. It was a lifetime decision. If you and I are going to follow Jesus, then we're going to have to literally, actually, and proactively rise and leave behind everything and anything which will keep us from being with him and being like him. Now let me give you very quickly three things that you and I are going to have to leave behind. No options on these things if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to answer that call. And this is the substance of the call of following Christ. Here they are. If you're going to follow Jesus, you cannot do so unless you leave behind any confidence in anything other than the person and work of Christ to gain you a right standing with God. Jesus said over in John chapter uh, 14 and verse 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. No other way to be right with God except through Jesus. He said this over in John chapter 6 and verse 40. He said, This is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life and I will raise Him up on that last day. And Paul even wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit over in Romans chapter, um, chapter 3 and verse 21 and following. He said this, The righteousness of God has been manifested that has been shown apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If you're not going to follow Jesus, we can't, have, we can't be trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ and something else. It is only the person and work 
of Christ alone. We have to leave everything else behind, any other confidence. Confidence in good works, confidence in church attendance, confidence in, in, in our heritage and, and all of those kind of things. There's a second thing we're going to have to leave behind. If you and I are going to follow Jesus, we're going to have to leave behind the practice of sin in our lives and pursue the righteousness of Jesus Christ. doesn't mean that we never sin again, but we leave behind the practice of sin. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and following. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that is, that is have, those of us who have been identified with Christ, are baptized into His death? Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, and he said this, that all who name the name of Christ must turn from iniquity. When Jesus began His earthly ministry, it says that he went out in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. He went out proclaiming the, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And here's what he said. Repent for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If we're going to follow Christ, we must leave behind the practice of sin. We must seek to sin no more. If we're not talking about sinless perfection, but we are talking about leaving the practice of sin behind. And one last thing in the very short time that we have left. If you and I are going to follow Christ, we're going to have to, number one, leave behind any confidence in anything other than the personal work of Christ to make us right with God. We're going to have to leave behind the practice of sin. And thirdly, we are going to have to leave behind our perceived right to rule over our own lives and bow down to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Listen to what John wrote over in 1 John chapter uh, 2, verses 3 through 6. He said this, listen carefully. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. That's how we know. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Folks, there's other things you might have to leave if you're going to follow Jesus. You might have to leave behind certain relationships outside of the church and sometimes even within the church in order to follow Jesus. Certain attitudes, certain opportunities, certain pursuits. But yet the call to you is to follow Jesus. May God be with you and bless you this day. We thank you for being with us today. We trust this message has been a blessing and a challenge in your life. If we can minister to you in prayer, or if you would like to partner financially with Faith at Work to help us spread the gospel message, please contact us at the address on your screen. And we invite you to join us again next week at this same time. Until then, may God bless you and may Christ Jesus be your Lord.